I'm Ashish. Uh, I'm a software engineering in of software engineer in stream processing team at Yelp. And today, like, we're going to talk about like how we we manage streaming infrastructure at Yelp. So a bit about Yelp, like what Yelp does. Yelp's mission is connecting people with great local businesses. This might involve like uh, to do in order to do, to do that, like we have a website, iOS, Android app, and as a as a user, they can like. Go on, the, go, on, go on, go to the app or a website. They can search for businesses. They can like uh, connect with the businesses, make reservation, or like get any code from the uh, from there. Yeah. And in this talk, like let's see like what we are going to see. So we'll start with the basic introduction, like what Yelp's uh, streaming ecosystem looks like, and then we'll slowly dive into the past, like how we started building all, uh, we, how we reached where we are right now, and in, in the following way. We'll talk more about like how what we change presently in our systems and like what we are embracing. Like for example, we are embracing SQL for data pipelines. There, we'll talk about all the challenges and strategies that we employed that we faced as like we were building and like scaling the scaling the platform, and like what future looks like for us. Like where we want to take our platform to and uh, how we are planning to do that. So, starting with like stream processing ecosystem at Yelp, I have broken down the. Uh, the system in like two different parts. Like this, the first part, control plane. By control plane, I mean like what does the deployment of like every, all the uh, ecosystem look like? We use Flink for our stream processing pipelines, and uh, we use Kubernetes to deploy those clusters. And here, the end-to-end -end flows look something like that. For example, like you, we have Pasta, which is our own in-house uh, in, in infrastructure as a service or offering that we have. They, then you have like, for example, like if you're going to deploy any streaming app, stream, stream process service, you have Yelp SOA. Yelp SOA, it's nothing but the Yelp specific service oriented architecture configs where you define your, what, what are your like service specific configurations. Pasta looks at that. It creates custom Kubernetes custom resources, puts them into, uh, into ETCD. And then we have our own custom Flink operator, which we, which we have written, which kind of like looks and modifies those, uh, and those custom resources and then creates Flink clusters. All our Flink clusters are deployed are deployed in like in, in its own Kubernetes namespace. So we have like Flink uh, Flink namespace there, and then our our Flink cluster has like three different components. Like two are like familiar to everyone, like who uses Flink, task manager, job manager, because that's what Flink provides. On top of that, like we have supervisor, whose job is to just like figure out like what into what cluster we uh, to this cluster what all jobs I need to submit. So we currently run all of Flink cluster in session mode. So like we are not using application mode as of now. And then supervisor looks at the serve configs. Serve configs is nothing but like service specific configs. For example, your service might need some static files that it need to read uh, to load the configs then. That's what it does. So supervisor interacts with those configs and then submits the job to the job manager. And Supervisor also has access to AWS DynamoDB. That's where we store the metadata information related to any job. Hey, what's my last checkpoint? What's my save point? How do I need to restore it from? And just submits the job to the job manager. And then job manager interacts with, has access to S3 because it needs to say, it needs to store all those checkpoints and job, uh, checkpoint and save point that it takes for the job. Now, moving on to like data plane, this is how a data plane looks like. So. On the right and on the left hand side, you have all the data sources that are possibly that you can use in a, in a streaming applications. For example, like we have MySQL CDC. We don't. We have our own in-house. Earlier, we had our own in-house CDC connector for MySQL, which we called Replication Handler. Then we moved to Debezium connector. What these connectors does is they take a message, they convert them into a Yelp specific data format we use, which we call data pipeline message. It is nothing but a wrapper over Avro, and then it has additional information related to like, hey, what was the schema? Uh, what was the schema ID which wrote this message down? And then it goes to Kafka. Then you have like Yelp schematizer, which is our, another in-house component, which is nothing but a schema registry, for example. Now, if you want to like use, uh, right now you have like conference schema registry and all those things. We had this was like, this is our own, own schema registry. Then you have Kafka. The, once the message comes into Kafka, that's where your like a streaming domain came into picture. They, we have different applications which might be reading data from Kafka and writing data back to Kafka. And then you have like some of the sync connectors which are like reading data from Kafka. They are pushing that data to Cassandra or they're pushing data to Redshift or Data Lake. 
So this is a very high level overview of like how our like data plane looks like. And then apart from the data, like for all these things, we also provide like certain CLI to our users, like which they can use to interact with uh, uh, with our ecosystem. So Pasta CLI, this is the, like a high level hybrid CLI, which provides like for any service that you're running on Pasta, you can say, hey, what's the status of my service? What is happening? What are the logs? Uh, give me the logs and all that stuff. Then supervisor CLI. Supervisor CLI allows you to operate, allows you to interact with Flink jobs. Like, hey, I don't, I want to stop this job. I want to start this job. I want to, I don't, I want to drop the state for this particular job. I don't want to drop the state. I want to do this particular save point, checkpoint, and all those information. Like, there are additional things that you can do with it. And on, and then you have data pipe CLI. Since like here, like we were talking about. Uh, there, there are like sync connect. There are source connectors there as well, like which are like dumping data from Cassandra to Kafka, MySQL to Kafka, and doing that stuff. So here, data pipe CLI is nothing but like another CLI that allows users to interact with all this ecosystem. For example, hey, I want to create a source connection to dump my data from MySQL to Kafka. Just say, hey, data pipe CLI, start connection, done. And then it also allows you to like look at the why, what's my schema structure looks like. And if you want to like, in, if you go back here, like you had like some streaming generic, generic streaming application like pipeline builder, joinery, stream SQL, SQL client. And if as a user you want to test, hey, what if I'm going to like submit this, put a Git PR and release this job, how is it going to work look like? You can do dry run using data pipe CLI. Hey, data pipe CLI, start dry run on this particular configuration and see, and let me observe like how my job will look, uh, how my output will look like, and if I want to like, uh, if this is ready for me or not. So it allows you to do that. And, and if you talk about the scale, so this is like what the scale we manage. Like we have different 50 different Flink services that are, that are running on our platform across 250 clusters. Why the difference? Because one service might have different instances running. So, and then you have on those clusters, you have roughly 2,600 jobs. This includes like all the source, all the sync connectors and source connectors jobs as well. And now let's go back in time and like start building like how we build build this thing. So I think like back in 2010, like we started this data moving towards like processing data processing journey, and we started with MR job. It is nothing but like map reduce. It was like a Python library to write your like map, uh, write and run Hadoop streaming jobs there at the time. And it was powering, like at, at the time, it was powering majority of our like top search, like hey, wh what are the like top searches on, on, on the search page, ads uh, and ads, etc. Now, and it became the big data processing standard at Yelp at the time. But as you can see, like it was back in 2010, it certainly has certain limitations. So, boiler, like let's talk about each of them individually. Boilerplate. By boilerplate, I mean like each MR job that user has to write, it has to be wrapped up with some boilerplate called like to wire configuration, what sources I need to consume from, where I need to where I need to write to, what is the runtime, and all those things, and even the actual record transformation. How should my record transformation look like? So it was like a bit tedious there, and then non-standard record structure because everyone is writing their own record transformation, and if you want to like use the same same kind of a schema down, down somewhere. You can't do that because there is no sharing happening. There is no standard way to utilize like what, uh, no standard way to define a scheme, define a structure there. And obviously this made like um, writing, like building cross team ETL pipelines a bit difficult. And then near real time processing was not supported. These were like a spark batch jobs, which used to like run daily, weekly on like on some specific cadence spaces. So there was no scope of like near real time processing here. Then Let's look at like how what we did to like reduce each of the individual boilerplate code there, uh, each or each of the limitations there. To reduce boilerplate, we introduced data pipeline. Data pipeline is nothing was which was just like built as a set of collection of tools and libraries so that like we can help our internal users to ease into the streaming uh, stream adoption. This included like this is not just like CLI tools and anything, but it also included certain like libraries like if you want. Uh, if you want to do data source discovery, what my uh, given as this schema, wh what where does my data live? It does the Kafka discovery. It does it provides you connectors. It provides you client libraries and everything. So all the ecosystem that we that we were talking about in the data plane, that's what like uh, that, that's what was built. Then standard standard we standardize the record structure. So everything that has to flow into data data pipeline has to adhere to Yelp specific data format, which we call 
ELP, uh, which we call data pipeline message, that we were seeing that everything was flowing as a data pipeline message. Now, data pipeline message is like contains schema information. By schema information, I mean what's the scheme ID, which is what's the reader scheme, who has the writer scheme ID, so who wrote this particular message, and then what can be the reader schema schema for that as well. And all the messages that are flowing in the data pipeline, they flow with di different types. Like message type can be your log message. So if you are if your messages are coming from service logs, they will be log messages. If it is coming from CDC, which are like, for example, MySQL Cassandra, they have to be, in, they have to create, update, delete, and in, uh, and refresh messages there. So to do this, we built Yelp Schematizer, which was not, which is not just a schema registry, but it does multiple different things into, into the same thing. It does schema registration. It handles uh, it does it handles schema and then it also does Kafka discovery. So basically, given any particular topic where in which Kafka cluster does my schema look like, it does all the thing and it provides you, it provides all that information. So using these tools, these are what we like. And now, so yeah, and anything like users want to do, for example, they want to look at what my schema look like. If they want to tail messages from the from the Kafka, they just have to specify. They can use data pipe CLI tool where they just say, "Hey, a data pipe, tail schema, this particular, and done. Everything is taken care of them." So from the now we have like abstracted the whole Kafka infrastructure and everything from the users. They don't have to worry about anything now. They are just talking in terms of schemas. And then for near real time support, we built Poststorm. Don't be confused by Storm word there. We didn't use Storm, so. <laughs> We basically, Sparstorm was our first general purpose stream processing platform. So we created a Python based stream processor, which just provided a simple, in a simple interface to do a simple transformation. Like you want to change, change you want to like map a particular message to a different stream, different message in terms of, let's say, hey, pick these fields, do that mapping. So very basic mapping it had. So it just provided a simple interface transform function using process message. So all the data pipeline messages will go to the process function, and in process function, you can do whatever processing you want to do, and then uh, output to down systems. Yeah. Let's move next. All, all good, but there are still certain limitations that, we, that, that were hit. Number one, scalability. So since like we are talking about, uh, we're running like Pyth uh, Python uh, Python stream processor, which is just providing a process message function. So scalability, we, to, you can only scale up. By, mean, by scaling up, I mean increase the partitions in Kafka. So if you increase the partition in Kafka, yeah, you're good. You can, get, you, you can, you can scale, the, scale the job. Operations, like there were very simple operations, uh, very simple operations that were provided. Right? In, uh, which were like stateless, so only like flat map. You want to convert this particular schema, this particular message format to some, yeah, you do it. There was no advanced construct like joins or aggregations or window triggering. There was not, nothing there. There was no stateful processing. Everything was stateless. So here, like, pass from what it, it is doing is reading messages, doing the transformation, and forgetting about anything. There is no statement state happening in between. So, and if there were like any use cases which had to like do some kind of a stateful, stateful processing, they have to do, figure out their own way to manage uh, the, that state. And then there is no multi-cluster support. By this, I mean, for example, consider a case where like you are running your app, you, you have your Kafka topics in two different, uh, two different regions, for example, US East, one and broad, US East and US West, basically because your website is running on two different, two different regions and you're getting the data there. Fast on is doesn't have the capability to like consume from both the different regions, so it was very re it was very region specific, so we couldn't do that. So to overcome this, Flink comes. So we provided uh, so we all to work on all the past from limitations, we introduced Flink as a platform. So initially, every it was exposed as a jar. So to provide to make to build the platform, we provided all the li extensive libraries around data pipeline that we were talking about, like writing the Kafka discovery schema, everything there, because if you're right, if any user is writing a Flink application, they still have to wire the serial, they still have to do serialization, they still have to deserialization, they still have to worry about finding the Kafka brokers and everything. So all of that, we built a library which was like hidden from the, which was pretty to users to the, now for users who are writing Flink application, they just have to say, hey, this is my, uh, for these particular schemas, give me the data stream. By data stream, I mean give me all, all the messages that are coming as, as part of a data stream there. So that's what we did. So in this case, users just have to bring their own jar, 
and submit the rest of the infrastructure, everything is taken care of. Care of them, they don't have to worry about anything. All good, and but we still had some issues. You can see like previously we were talking about Python, Python, Python. So Yelp is a Python shop, so there is like very low, very less services which are written in any other, like for example, Java, JVM stack there. And when we started with Flink, it was around version 1.5, 1.4, or 1.6, I don't remember correctly, but like, yeah, you can see like Py API at that Python API in Flink was not, not, mat not as matured as Scala or like Java. So what we did, we used Beam. So you use Beam to define your, app, during your streaming application in Python, and you run it on top of Flink. So that's what we did there. And then all good, but now you still have the cases, for example, if you have multiple users who are coming in and say they're just doing the same kind of, they're writing the same kind of Flink applications, that is small, simple, simple transformations. Do you want that many applications to run or you can do something better? So what we did, we provided data enrichment and transformation as a service. So what users can do is, now they just need to bring a simple YAML configuration. They don't have to worry about writing Flink application. They can specify their queries as Stream SQL. It was a SQL service, which kind of like uh, provided users a way to define their data transformation in terms of SQL. Joinery was our, our custom built in unwindowed join application where like given any two streams you can join those windows on any key in a out in a join outer join full join so and then aggregation was you can aggregate uh, your topic on any based on any key that's what we did so and for these users don't even have to write flink application or like any application what they need to do was write a simple yaml configuration get commit push and you're done so that's your like whole data pipe and your data streaming use case can be built using the very simple yaml configurations All good, but still, there are like use cases which kind of requires, they first want to do some kind of SQL manipulation, mm -hmm. then they want to do like some kind of joins, then after that join there can be some kind of aggregation that they're doing, then they're doing SQL back, and then joins back. So you are hierarchy, like if you like have to write uh, all these YAML in different, different, three different, for three different services, it becomes very chaotic. So we, we built Pipeline Builder, which was like a combination of all these into one single thing. So it was like a complete uh, wrapper of all these things that we talked about, stream SQL, joinery, aggregator. It had like multi-source support, multi-sync, so you can like read from multiple sources, you can write to multiple syncs. It provided on non-windowed joins, because we are using joinery here, because join, joinery is provided as interface there. Aggregations, again, because we have aggregator, and UDF support, uh, users can write any, user can write a PyTransformation function, so you want to transform, do some call, do something, you can use UDFs there. So these were all as, as component, and because the interface was, interface is now, uh, if in the future you want to add any new uh, transformation, like new support there, you can just like pro, pro, uh, do it via the uh, in, interface way. And all these things are, are, are exposed as a component. So in YAML file, now you have component definitions. This was all good, but now we need to move forward as well. So now you have like too many options. Data flow as a platform. So you, if you want to write your own Java or on, on, on applications, you can use Java, which is vanilla flink. You can use, if you want to use Python, why not? Like you, you have Beam now. Data flow as configuration. You want to like just define all your streaming use case in terms of configuration, you can use Pipeline Builder. If you are use case just of connection that is dumping, picking from some source and down to some like sync, you can use data pipeline tools. All good, but like there are like a lot of things going on here. Like there is it's not just like we are providing good things to the to our users, but it is increasing our maintenance load as well because we have to maintain all these different services that we all the portfolio that we have built and as you know, like with Flink, if you want to upgrade different, upgrade to different versions, or you like want to modernize, that's where you hit the problems with state compatibility. How do you do it? And since there we have like multiple users who are using the systems, how do you like modernize and like move forward and like clear up the tech depth that you have built? So, what we do? We want to simplify the ecosystem without losing the gener uh, generality that we have. So, we decided to reduce the portfolio that without impacting much of the users that we, you, much of the user's ability to define data pipelines. So we want to follow the industry, like what is happening in the industry, because we don't want to get 
get behind you. And in this case, you can't beat open source, Yelp. We had built like a rich internal ecosystem, but which nothing, because nothing like this existed. But now, if you want to follow the industry, like what is happening in the industry, like we have to move forward. For a few examples, like we talked about Flink operator. We talked about Flink operator. We wrote a custom Flink operator, but now we have Flink operator within the, like, the Flink ecosystem as well. But we can't use it because we have like, tied our whole ecosystem to that. On, and then next, for example, we talk about a schematizer. We have built our own schema, schema registry, but there are open source schema registries, but we can't directly move, move there. We talked about data, data format, like Avro, like people nowadays use Avro. There is JSON, but like we are still tied to like real specific things. So how do we move forward? So, and if you like look at all those things, there are new features coming in with these, all these new, all these open source systems. You can't port them back because it is not feasible to put all the functionality of open source system within your custom components back. It's much better to like move forward. So we started, oh, why not use SQL? Like we have, yeah, it's good to, that we had joinery, which did on Windows join, but like we can do that with SQL as well. So let's move to SQL. So we built SQL client, not to be confused with Flink SQL client. So Flink SQL, this is kind of a wrapper over Flink SQL, which provided Yelp connectors and along with like Python UDF support to the users. So our goal here was, like, was if you can express your data pipe, data transformation, data pipeline, SQL statement, you should do that. You should not like uh, use any other things. What this did, what we aimed was to improve developer experience. Most of the people are familiar with SQL. Not everyone is familiar with Flink. Not everyone is familiar with Flink and APIs and all, on, on top of it. So, and if everyone, if you expect everyone to get familiarized with that, that's not feasible as well because then, oh, I don't want to do that. Not every, because they have different uh, work to do as well. And then improve processing efficiency. In this case, like we were running an older Flink versions 1.11 and everything, and with newer Flink versions coming into picture, we have seen that a lot of improvements happening in terms of save point, in terms of checkpoints, in terms of uh, schema in some like state compatibility as well. So we didn't want to be stuck with the older one. So like we started using Flink 1.17.2. That's what, where we are with SQL client. And then reduce platform maintenance. Earlier we were using a lot of, we were providing a lot of systems to the users that we have to maintain. And with every single maintenance, there is like a very overload, very considerable amount of time that we had to spend because we had to maintain all those systems and they were running on different Flink versions. So you have to see that we have to maintain those Flink libraries as well for them. And then like we migrate away from legacy data flows and since like many teams have invested a considerable amount of time, data, uh, considerable amount of time to build data pipelines and we consider now them as legacy, how do we like support them when they are migrating? So this is where we are right now in the process of migration to SQL client. I'll just like briefly like talk about like some of the challenges and strategies that we faced along the way as a platform. And these are not like specific to Flink. These are, will come like more from the platform. If you're maintaining a platform, what issues like we face and like what are the, what are the strategies that we use there? So number one is Flink pool auto scaling. If we go back to our diagram, we have our own, own Kubernetes pool that is, uh, that is used to like run Flink clusters. So we are letting users define their own resource config. They can define how many CPUs, how many memories, how many disks they want to use. Now, if you have all good, all good, like if you have very few use cases, but if you have, if your platform, if your use usability implodes and you have a lot of users now uh, running their jobs on, on your platform and you are handling variable loads, you are going to hit bin packing issues. Because if you don't define, your, if you are, there's no way to define a proper connection between memory, CPU, CPU and disk, whatever autoscaler you want to use, you can't use it up to like, let's say if you want to use all the 100% resources, you can't do that because that's not possible. Then you, when you do the pool autoscaling, it's going to like face the issues. So what we do it, there were two things that we did. One was the flink, we, when we introduced the concept of compute units, we let's fix the ratio of CPU, memory and disk. So if you want to use if your use case is memory heavy and you have 25 gigs of memory, you get 
you get corresponding that you get that much amount of CPU as well. Doesn't matter if you use it or not, it makes our life easier because then we are not hitting the issues that we have and now we are not getting paged at night. And then next was the Flink Auto Tuner. This was another component that we worked on because not everyone likes resizing their, their clusters. So what we provided was a very, not, not fine grain, but like at the CPU memory and disk level uh, auto, auto, auto tuning configuration where users can say, hey, how frequently you want to auto tune your, auto -tune your clusters if they say like one day. We look at the past seven or like two weeks of data to we cut all the spikes that we see uh, there. And then we generalize, okay, your cluster might need these many CPUs, this much memory, this much disk, and we take care of that, we take care of defining those things. And these, like, again, like Flink Auto doesn't look at the fine grained uh, Flink resource configuration because, for example, in, within Flink, if you give 20, you are giving some amount of memory to it, that is distributed differently to JVM, Metaspace, off heap memory, rocks DB differently. So we are not looking at those specific configurations, we are looking at very high level configurations here. Next was problems related to session clusters. Uh, as like if some, if I guess all would, if nobody knows what session clusters are, session clusters are long running clusters where like they keep on running and you can submit jobs to them, they can cancel the jobs, but they are long running clusters. They are not like, they come up like uh, when they are. So longer downtime for small jobs can, will happen. For example, if you have 50 different jobs that are running on your single cluster and one of the job is taking a long time to check uh, to save point that is like 30 minutes or one hour. That means all the jobs that have shut down earlier and you're doing a cluster restart, that won't happen until that largest job has, has taken a save point. So that doesn't work well. Resource utilization, now you are also seeing yourself providing resource to the cluster in terms of the largest job. Whatever the largest job that is running on the cluster, you are providing the resource to that. That means there is resource wastage happening somewhere else on the cluster as well. And then job reliability, one job goes down, it is causing problem on the task manager, all the other jobs that are running on the task manager are also going down. So it is a very uh, feedback loop where, which is happening on the cluster, now you have to, oh, everything goes. So it's kind of a bad neighbor problem. What we did? Not exactly job-based deployment model again, Flink application mode, but we enforced that all these, all the jobs that are going to run on our platform, they're going to run as single job per cluster. So you will have, each job will have its own dedicated Flink cluster. Unbounded S3 costs because we are saving checkpoint and save, save point data on S3. So, and if you don't have any retention policy, you are keep going to increase that cost high as it goes. And with increased scale, with increased adoption, the S3 cost earlier it might be minimal, but as you, your platform grows, it becomes very huge. And we are saying because save points, we are only taking save point at the time of job shutdown, so there is no point, we can't delete checkpoints as well because now if your checkpoint is pointing to the previous checkpoint and you delete those files, it kind of, kind of corrupted state problem there. And there was no re retention policy there, so what we did, like tiered storage, so you can move older checkpoints to, uh, to cold storage and use that. Another thing that we did was introduce periodic save points, so are now all the jobs on a platform are taking save point periodically, like at least once a day. That way, like we can safely re uh, uh, set a retention policy, which can archive all uh, the older, save all, all the checkpoints without causing any state compatibility or state problem, state corruption problems. Then Flink state compatibility also happens. Like Flink doesn't guarantee state compatibility between versions, and version upgrade this causes version upgrades to become difficult. So for that, silent backfill to the rescue. So you have silent backfills running, you start, you start a backfill process and you don't output the data to the downstream topic until your backfill is done to the, to the correct offsets. Then migration, we are talking about a lot of migrations on, on the process with continuous evolution, you will face, inevitably face the need for migration as well. And these migrations vary greatly. It can be version upgrades, onboarding users to the new systems that you're building, and this, these lead to migration fatigue. And migrations can also interfere with the primary business goal of your user teams. So what should we do? There are like different strategies, like we, are, we went to the route one, forced migrations via yearly planning, so you can like talk to your stakeholders to say, like previously, so that they can plan, plan it accordingly and can allocate some time to it. Another idea is like to build new system in parallel and let natural attrition 
happen on old systems. So basically, build new systems in such a way that they sell it on their own, so that like you you are deprecating old older things as well. Another problem, I think, someone if we like Yingji was mentioning schema evolution, schema changes on upstream topics are inevitable. People normal users are going to have different different columns added on the onto the MySQL table. Changes happening there, so. And all these changes lead to like uh, state incompatibility in Flink table environment. You can't do anything about it. Again, silent backwards to the rescue here. Just I'll quickly cover the future, like where we are like heading to. So regarding the first thing is like we are looking at the open source. Like we can we want to leverage all the open source technologies that there are, and we, we don't want to like put most of the effort. And so most of our effort today is going towards aligning with the open source software or, of, or open source ecosystem. And we are getting ready for the stream house. So in terms of data format and schema registries, we want to migrate it to the off-the-shelf -the off -the schema management tool, but we can't do it directly because our, we have our own custom format. So for that, we are using SQL client to wire an adapter. So basically, you have you read the data from Kafka uh, in terms of you, you deselect the, the data using data pipe, your Yelp-specific con source connector, and then you write it back in with standard uh, Flink connectors, which are like writing in, for example, AvroDBZM format or something else. And then you have your standard source connectors and sync connectors. And then we are like looking at Streamhouse, which is uh, our next evolutionary stuff for our architecture. So I think like if for interested folks, you should definitely read the Streamhouse blog by Ververica, where they are talking about how they are trying to combine batching, batch processing and stream processing into the same one because they're not that much different. And we want to like move to open standards in terms of data, record encoding, metadata, schema management, and using object storage as well. So that's what we're exploring today. So we are like right now uh, in the phase of exploring Apache Pymon as the replacement. So this is the spec of choice for us to implement Streamhouse. This kind of like separates compute from storage as a rising wave guys we're talking about, so you have separate compute layer, you have separate storage layer, and it has extensive data management support as well. It provides you data lineage inbuilt, so you don't have to worry about uh, how, in, if some issue, go, issue happens in some particular flink job, what all sources, what all things it impacts, and what, all the, what are the uh, issues that it can happen. Then in schema evolution is another one, so it kind of gives you schema evolution by default with flink CDC connectors which is a good thing that we want to use, and that kind of like also limits our use case, use case of Kafka just to log specific data pipelines rather than CDC pipelines as well. We can deprecate Kafka completely out of the picture here. Incremental data inconsistency fixes. This is more related to like when you have huge data pipeline, which is like starting from one source going to sync, and those are consumed by something else. How do we figure out where exactly the issue is happening? So with data lineage feature, we should be able to like do that. And then lookup joins is another one where the major problem with our, our services we see is like when you're doing joins on over two tables where one table is not changing that much, it is like you can consider it as static as well, then the another table kind of frequently changes. So it kind of like makes it, and when you have to do silent backfills, you still have to do the whole backfill for the entire, entire state. So with lookup joins, we should be able to move, move past that problem and at least have something new there. I think like I'll cut the thing. Uh, yeah, thank you. And this is if you have any questions, suggestions, you can email me or like we can talk after later. Yeah. We have time for a couple of questions if you have any. No. Okay. Okay, so um, you mentioned a little bit like you were looking at something like a rising wave or those kinds of things, but at some point, I mean, this has been, this development has happened over some years also in the open source industry, you know, moving to SQL based standards, something like materialize or yep. rising wave. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, it seemed like you were working around the technology or your people, you know, staying with Python for a long time? You know, can you talk a little bit about you know why did you go down this path for so long and not just stop and look for for different solutions maybe, um, or 
Does, uh, does that make sense? Like you sort of kept building internal tooling rather than maybe more quickly moving to an open source sort of path. I think like that's what we made what we did wrong earlier, like we had like all this ecosystem built from the starting, so everything, and it's not easy when, like, when you see like everything is so ingrained within your old data pipeline infrastructure, it becomes difficult to move a piece out. For example, like I was talking about schematizer. Yelp schematizer is kind of a very critical service for us. Like if it goes down, Yelp goes down. So how do you like remove that individual piece without breaking the existing functionality? That's like that's what the challenges were at that time, and uh, now we are we are actually looking at that problem and say, hey, well, how, what, what can we do to fix for that? For example, with SQL client, that's what we are trying to do. You read from your specific format, move the data to schema, different conference schema, for example, and then oh, its own, own, own data format. We're using Avro as well. So that's why, where we are moving to. But at that time, I think that's the thing that we were more concerned about, like how do we move the entire ecosystem that we've built by just moving a one-piece component at a time. That's like still a big challenge for us, but like we are seeing, we'll, we'll try to solve that problem pretty soon, yeah. Cool, thank you so much for your presentation. We're gonna yep. go uh, for a coffee break right now. And if you're interested in buying a t-shirt for the conference, then you can do so at the info point uh, in the entrance uh, from the building. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.